All right, well, this will be our first class for um, our first lecture, I suppose, for the soil fertility class. And in some ways, this lecture is just intended to kind of frame some of what we'll talk, be talking about this semester. Um, really, this this first week, this semester, or this this lecture, and then the next lecture, we'll do um, a lot of kind of the framing in terms of how we might think about soil fertility. Okay, so we'll we'll go ahead and get started thinking about functions of soil. Uh, of course, soil occupies a huge percentage of the land area of the globe, um, and we can think of this very kind of anthropomorphically as a, as a medium or a function for a number of different things. And so, uh, of course, soil um, provides a medium for plant growth. It's highly important, really critically important for regulating water supplies, uh, for filtering water, for recycling raw materials through uh, the entire decomposition process. Soil houses really important soil organisms. It's an engineering medium, of course, for a lot of our infrastructure that we build. Many, many types. That This certainly isn't a comprehensive list, but we can think about it from this perspective. And we can also think about uh, soil more, a little bit more holistically from kind of an ecosystem perspective and thinking about the different ecosystem services that soil delivers, right? And so some of these that you see here, uh, provision for uh, food, f fiber, and fuel, carbon sequestration, water purification um, are a bit redundant with that last slide, but you know, suffice it to say that, that soil has many, many different types of functions, and our civilization, society, our, our global existence and footprint wouldn't be possible without uh, this really precious resource. So that's kind of the plug and thinking of soil in terms of all the various roles that it might play. Soil fertility in particular, and narrowing down a bit into you know, what this course is um, going over, uh, is probably perhaps the function of soil that's most commonly manipulated and managed for outcomes, okay? And so I'll, I, I'd argue in general that manipulating soil fertility is one of the easier things to do relative to say manipulating soil biology or manipulating soil physical structure. So um, of course there's you know caveats to all that and we, we could of course debate some of some of it but for fertility's sake we often uh, manipulate and manage soil pH for our desired outcomes whatever those may be maybe they're growing crops maybe they're establishing prairie restoration etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and then also, of course, thinking about available nutrients, um, whether there's too much of one thing or too little of one thing, but thinking about either fertilization or um, you know, making nutrients less available through various mechanisms or various practices. So soil fertility is something that when we think about soils and functioning of soil this is something we often intervene in uh, as a as a species to manipulate right so broadly if we want to think about what actually is soil fertility how do we we define that well uh, that Havlin textbook that I that I alluded to which really is a basis of a lot of the information the kind of presenting the foundational or core concepts of this course um, defines fertility as the quality of a soil which enables us uh, enables it to provide chemical elements in quantities and proportions so the right quantity the right proportion etc cetera, etc cetera. and you can see this this word chemical is a, a big part of that right so historically traditionally we've thought of soil fertility and soil chemistry as um, one and the same or at least highly related fields and I'd say that we'd really uh, for this course we're perhaps going to think of it a little bit more synthetically a little bit more comprehensively uh, not just the chemistry but um, the biology and the physical structure we can't ignore those because both of those pieces play really important roles in terms 
of uh, providing, you know, uh, dictating the outcomes of, of how much chemistry, the quantities and proportions of this chemistry might be available to plants. So does soil fertility equal productivity? Well, um, this is a, a concept uh, that, you know, we could go on and on for, but we think about uh, is there a really good relationship between fertility and productivity, whether that be a crop productivity or net ecosystem primary productivity or whatever whatever our metric is, you know, whether it be grain yield or above ground biomass or total carbon fixed, for example, in an ecosystem, um, are these things uh, similar? And I would argue that they're, they're, they're really not the same things. Many, many factors contribute to plant productivity, crop productivity. There's climatic factors such as precip, air temperature, humidity, solar radiation, et cetera, et cetera. There's crop factors like genetics, that the you know the genetic diversity that might exist within a population, the rooting activity. If it's a managed system, um, the planting population, if there's pests and disease that interact with those crops. And then there's a whole suite of soil factors. Um, soil food webs, organic matter cycling, the actual physical texture, the drainage class, on and on we might go. Um, and in that soil factors, you know, fertility is one of many different pieces. So just the, the concept that, you know, we shouldn't, when we're talking and thinking about soil fertility, we shouldn't think um, that fertility really is, a, is the primary or the, the major driving factor for total plant productivity. There's lots and lots of things that, that go into this, okay? So just as something that's good to kind of keep in mind when we're thinking about what soil fertility means, how we're going to define it, how we're going to think about it and frame it. So, you know, I've already kind of stated my bias uh, in the last um, recording, thinking about, you know, ag and a lot of folks are coming to the class um, thinking about soil fertility in an, in an ag context. Well, um, it's important when we're thinking about fertility to talk about, you know, stress and, and yields and um, yields in, in, in a general sense. And so worldwide, you know, we could ask the question, what are the largest sources of climate and soil stresses that reduce crop yield potential? And this really could be thought of broadly and not just in terms of managed crops, but in, in natural systems as well. And so if we ask that question, you know, I know we're not gathered together in a class, but what would be some of the things that would come to mind? What are the, some of the largest sources of climate and soil stress that reduce uh, plant, plant potential, plant productivity? Well, according to a relatively dated source, but a lot of this really hasn't changed, or I wouldn't suspect it to have changed dramatically in the last, say, 16 years or so. Um, but crop yields and stress worldwide, uh, really it's not, not too surprising that available water and temperature are major, major sources of stress um, and reduce crop yields. But the number three, three piece here is nutrients, okay? And so we can say that environment and nutrient related stresses occur on 55 and 20 percent of cropland respectively. So Environmental stresses, things like uh, enough water, too high a temperatures or too low a temperatures, essentially on more than half of the cropland acres globally, and then nutrient stresses on uh, maybe 20%. And you know these are big, big ballpark numbers. Um, I'm not sure what the error bar is here, but of course we could think about a lot of times, even in Ohio, a place that cropland receives a lot of fertilization, uh, there could be, you know, uh, depending on the nutrient, depending on the year, up to a fifth of the acres um, in some sort of nutrient stress as well. So that wouldn't be a common scenario, but, you know, we can think about this in a more local context as well. So the table here, again, this, this is from uh, the Havlin textbook, but talking about breaking those water stresses and temperature stresses down into, and nutrient stresses down into a few separate categories and what those might, might look like. 
Okay, so uh, you know, I'll just end by saying, or I'll end that 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 book book note, thinking about global stresses to crop to productivity. Um, we need to recognize that soil fertility is a very important component to crop production and, and overall fertility uh, overall productivity. But solely focusing on soil fertility while neglecting physical and biological properties is misguided. It's myopic in terms of uh, we think that all we need to grow crops or all we need to do is fertilize and, you know, a-okay, everything's great. That's really um, a misguided perception and it's a perception that's, I don't think, really um, widespread anymore, but perhaps uh, 20, 30 years ago was a lot more common than, than it is now. So... Fertilizer isn't everything, right? I just told you that. Why do we fertilize soils? Well, we do it for a lot of good reasons. Some of them not good reasons, but um, the good reasons are listed here. There's a limited supply of nutrients from the soil. Um, we have agricultural systems that produce tremendous amounts of harvestable product, and there's a lot of biomass that's leaving fields in you know any given time period. So. Um, there's an inch increasing demand for productivity um, from a farm scale economic perspective, from a large kind of population perspective. Um, there's limited space. Of course, nearly all of the quote unquote good cropland is already being used for cropland. And so um, when we are going to be increasing cropland acres in the world globally, uh, there's not very many places that are left that we can do it, and it's usually at the demise of really pristine ecosystems. So uh, typically if cropland acres increase, it's creeping on more and more marginal lands. So um, this, is, again, is a projection. I'm not sure where it comes from, um, but without fertilization, much more land would be needed, maybe 30% more. I would think that that's a low, a low number, maybe 50% more if we didn't fertilize at all in the globe, how much crop will we produce, how much more land will we need to produce the same amount of crops. It would be a large, large percentage. So, so we fertilize for lots of good reasons, right? And, and we need to recognize that, you know, um, whether we like it or not, there's a, we, we live in a, in a global society that uh, there's a huge demand for food, fiber, and fuel. And, um, and we need to in some ways uh, meet those needs and, and recognize that, right? So um, fertilization is a, a major piece to that puzzle um, and, and it enables us you know, to live the lifestyles that we live and, um, and really to, to feed people all across this world. Um, in the United States specifically, crop yields have increased greatly over the last 50 years due to a variety of reasons. Okay, so now we're just going to like, instead of talking in such big terms, we might bring things a little bit closer to home. Think about a temperate, um, a temperate ecosystem, say, in the United States. Uh, so really, our yields have, have more than doubled over the last 50 years due to a number of factors, development of, of improvement of hybrids and new varieties. So this is you know the, the, the marvel of plant breeding, uh, nutrient and pest management. So we know much more about managing nutrients and pests, soil and con uh, water conservation practices to, to increase or to sustain our resources, cultural practices, and then this idea of development and use of fertilizer, of course, um, not just organic fertilizer sources, but inorganic fertilizer sources have, have really enabled um, uh, crop yields to, to, to double and in some areas, you know, triple or even quadruple in the last 50 years. But there's always challenges, and in, in many cases, you know, for this class, the rest of the semester, we'll be talking about trade-offs. And um, soil fertility, there's a, there's a, a lot of uncertainty um, that we deal with, and so our challenge is really to manage soils. So we want to apply sufficient nutrients to meet crop demand, but we don't want to just do it without regard, right? We want to do this judiciously, and so... 
to nutrient losses to the environment, causes lots and lots of problems, and at the farm level, uh, tremendous losses and profitability if nutrients aren't managed properly. And so, in an Ohio field crop perspective, you know, aside from seed, one of the biggest expenses that an Ohio farmer incurs is their fertilizer bill and paying for fertilizer. And so, uh, if they're not careful about that, they can be over applying a lot of fertilizer and really compromising farm profitability. So, um, and this is, you know, in some ways, kind of classic soil fertility where we've got a soil test level and our percent yield, so crop yield, when it's less than 100, um, we're seeing a sacrificing yield. And as the soil test level increases, we hit this critical point where anything, any nutrients applied above the soil test level essentially aren't going to increase yield. So we've saturated or reached that plateau. And this is, you know, kind of a, a common generalized relationship that we find in soil fertility. And you don't need me to, I'm sure you're all well aware of what happens when we over fertilize, right? So the environmental consequences. And we'll talk a bit more about a lot of this as the course progresses, but the fertilizer that we apply has tremendous consequences for our atmospheric and water resources globally, not just in the United States, not just in Ohio, but it's a global issue. And so um, contribution to atmospheric degradation through greenhouse gases, mainly nitrous oxides and methane coming from agricultural fields. Um, is a, a major source of pollution as well as uh, water pollution um, from primarily nitrogen and phosphorus sources. And so, you know, this is an issue that's particularly relevant in Ohio and we talk about quite a bit. We'll talk a lot more about it as the semester progresses. These are just graphs that show uh, nitrogen, uh, as your nitrogen rate increases, emission levels uh, increase and turn exponential. And here we've got dissolved reactive phosphorus for, um, for manure, uh, coming from manure as our soil test level increases, we're essentially getting um, more dissolved reactive phosphorus entering the waterway. So these are, again, generalized relationships that we, that we find. Okay, so um, we want the right, you know, the right nutrients in the right place. Well, let's talk about a little bit of the specifics of each one of these nutrients. Um, essential elements in plant nutrition. Element is considered essential to plant growth if the element is directly involved in the nutrition of the plant, um, if a deficiency makes it impossible for that plant to complete its life cycle, and if a deficiency to a specific element can only be prevented by correcting with that specific element. So in other words, that third point is like we can't substitute out one nutrient for an X and the plant makes do. So here we're thinking about essential elements in plants. Um, we have essential elements, of course, for our bodies. Most, a lot of those elements are the same as in plants, but it's not the exact same list of characters. Um, so when a plant is not getting its essential elements, there's usually some sort of visual deficiency symptom that might manifest, okay? So overall, there's 17 essential elements that all plants need, all vascular plants need for growth. Um, three are not really mineral nutrients. Um, those are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, okay? As I'm sure uh, you've all heard these terms before. Six are macronutrients, that is, they occur in large quantities. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium are six macronutrients. And then there's eight micronutrients, okay? And again, this course we're going to go through and basically deal with each one of these nutrients um, time by time. The micronutrients we're not going to spend a lot of time on, but we're going to spend a fair amount of time on the, the main three, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then some of these secondary macronutrients as well. Um, but they're all, you know, the important point for here and for what we're discussing now is that all of these things are really essential for crop growth, okay? Um, and so 
if a if a plant doesn't have um, all 17 of these things, it's it's not going to be able to to complete its life cycle and function as it normally would. So I mentioned the first three aren't mineral. That you know sometimes we consider them structural nutrients, and this will take you back a bit to maybe intro bio, bio 101, or even you know high school biology, but. Plants, what are plants made of? Well, they're made of a lot of things, but primarily they're made up of three things. They're made up of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Um, and it's, they're a product of photosynthesis. And so if we think about carbon, it's primarily plants primarily get their carbon from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? And they primarily get their oxygen through two sources, atmospheric oxygen O2, or H2O water, right? And so that's where the oxygen comes and the hydrogens are coming from water. So here's our formula that we know. We've got carbon dioxide plus water plus energy, i.e. sunlight. Uh, we take that oxidized carbon and we reduce it to a carbohydrate to this C6H12O6. This is a simple sugar, um, maybe glucose or ribose or what, what have you, but it's a reduced carbon and it produces oxygen, right? This is, uh, should be familiar, this is the stuff that life on planet Earth comes from. It's what it's made of. And plants are really 90, 95, 96, 98% carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. That's really what they are with a small spattering of, of other nutrients, okay? So, you know, make no mistakes from kind of a mass perspective. Uh, plants are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, they're carbon dioxide and water. That's what they are made of and that's, you know, that's where uh, where life as we know it comes from. It's pretty incredible to think that we can boil it down, you know, into those terms, but, you know, that's the reality that that, um, that we're dealing with. So we think about um, primary and secondary nutrients. I, I guess, let me just skip back real quick. You know, I, I didn't talk about the major sources or the concentration, but you can see 45 and 45, that's 96%. Uh, that, that makes up 96%, right? And so, again, this is going to vary quite a bit depending on the plant, the plant part, the stage of development, etc. But, you know, think about these as averages. They're not absolute values, but Primary and secondary nutrients, these are our macronutrients, N, P, K, calcium, ag, and, and sulfur. Here's, again, we're going to get into each one of these, but here's, you know, a quick chart overview. It's just nice to have all this in one place at the beginning of the semester. Here's the forms that they're primarily taken up from. Here's the major sources that plants get them from, and here's the relative concentrations. So you can see that nitrogen and potassium are really the the two largest nutrients, aside from carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, that plants take up and hold in concentration. And then phosphorus, cal uh, well, sorry, then calcium, then phosphorus, magnesium, and sulfur as kind of second um, secondary. So if we, you know, this is ranked based on, I don't know what, but like how we often list these nutrients, but if we rank them by concentration in the plant, um, on average, the, the the order would be a little bit different. It'd go N, K, calcium, and then phosphorus, mag, and sulfur would be um, pretty similar. Okay. Likewise, we can do this with micronutrients, and you can see why. Looking at this concentration tab, why they're called micronutrients, and it's because they occur in really really small quantities in the plants. Okay. So here's our eight micronutrients, and you know I'll leave it to you to go through this and kind of look at it and we're again we're going to deal with this as the semester progresses. Soil fertility and nutrient availability is affected by a number of things um, and we can often think of this and we'll, this will be the framework that we use for a lot of our cycles additions, removals, transfers, and transformations. Thinking about you know drawing a box around our system, around our, whether that be a, a field in, in, in agricultural context, whether it be, you know, a watershed or whether it be, um, you know, a plot of land where a forest is or whatever it might be, wherever we're going to like conceptually draw our box, we can think of a mass balance of that ecosystem of materials that are flowing in 
materials that are leaving and materials that are shape-shifting internally, right? And so additions, removals, transfers, and transformations that might happen. And so you'll hear me say it like a mass balance perspective. Well, what does that mean? That means the you know nitrogen coming into the system through deposition, through biological fixation, through fertilizers, all has a mass to it. It's, it you know it weighs something. So we can quantify to the best of our ability things that are moving into the system, things that are moving out of that system or that field or that soil, et cetera. And so we think about um, all of these things matter. So it's not just about like what's there at any given time, but we also have to consider what's coming in as an addition, what's leaving the system. Sometimes we don't want it to leave. Sometimes, you know, um, it's leaching or denitrification. We're, we're losing nutrients. So that, you know, wouldn't be considered particularly a, a great thing. But this, again, this mass balance approach, you know, is important. And then we're almost done here, but um, just to talk about uh, some crop yield limiting factors. So this is, again, like to frame this class, very important concept that was uh, generated a long, long time ago, decades, um, almost a century ago. Law of the minimum, and this is this idea that crop yield is constrained by the most limiting nutrient or resource. And you see this picture of a bucket that's, um, you know, common, common um, as a way to represent this. And it's the idea that Yield potential or productivity will never be reached until each one of these pieces, each one of these slats in this uh, bucket, are all the way to the top and fully addressed. And that way, the bucket can be essentially made completely full. But when there's one thing, whether that be a nutrient or you know a resource, nutrient water, crop yield potential, in this scenario, water is the most limiting nutrient, and so. Regardless of how much nitrogen or how much magnesium we add, if we don't address water, then our yields aren't going to improve, right? So it's the law of the minimum. The minimum thing is what needs to get corrected first for yield to increase. And so here we might irrigate and then our water is completely alleviated. Uh, that water constraint is alleviated. But then the next thing might be nitrogen, and again, you know, the yield might increase from this level to here. But until we address that nitrogen uh, limitation or stress, uh, we're not we're never going to get anywhere if we do it just with phosphorus or silicon chloride, et cetera, et cetera. So these are are you know again this kind of classic law of the minimum. And I will say that. Um, this is, you know, related, but uh, these things are, are kind of additive, and so here we've got nitrogen input versus um, crop yield and, and different factors. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and here, maybe our limiting factors are water, phosphorus, and seeding rate. So maybe we address water here, and it bumps it up, our crop yield bumps up to this B level. But we still have a couple things, phosphorus and seeding rate. And so when we address phosphorus, you know, it, it um, bumps that yield up. So in other words, these, these factors, these yield limiting factors are additive. And if we deal with water, phosphorus, seeding rate, et cetera, we actually hit our true yield potential. And that's what D is representing here. So this is, you know, fairly conceptual, but you know, no surprising, uh, not surprising in an ag context, we, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to alleviate as many stresses as possible, make that crop as happy as possible, and, um, and in that case, ensure the, you know, optimizing productivity. Okay, so uh, final slide here. Um, to summarize, maintaining soil productivity is a major part of maintaining sustainable soil productivity. So thinking about fertility as really um, mostly the nutrients that crops are going to see, but productiv productivity is a larger, more comprehensive uh, thing uh, where we've got crop and atmosphere and soil factors all feeding into what makes up soil productivity. So. Productivity is based on physical, chemical, and biological properties. 
but it's in it's can be influenced by the environment and by humans uh, so how our management influences physical chemical and biological properties is is tremendously important in terms of our productivity and our and our desired outcomes okay so management plays a role of course um, it's not everything it's not all of it but it plays a large role in, in how productive soils might be so we often say in the field that there's a large amount of uncertainty when it comes to predicting nutrient availability and we'll talk more about this again as the semester rolls on but when we think about fertility there really is a bit of science I mean there's a lot of science behind here but there's there's some art as well and there's some best guessing and just kind of detective work that's involved and so you know it makes this idea of being somebody that's working in the field of soil fertility not just a formulaic um, exercise where you encounter condition A, B, and C and then you've got some optimized solution but you need experience and you need you know cons consulting to figure out uh, maybe with colleagues or other peers or other you know other folks to figure out exactly what's going on in any given field and sometimes you're you're not sure uh, I think it's this but you know maybe it's not uh, this is what I'd recommend and um, you know apply you know uh, here's the prescription in a sense apply that fertilizer do this or that thing and see if if the conditions improve and you know this really isn't any different than what happens if you go to your doctor and say hey I'm not feeling great and the doctor maybe runs some diagnostic blood work and they're not entirely sure but they have a hunch it might be this or they want to rule a few things out before they you know move on to other things so there's parallels here and I just you know I'll just say that there's um, I'll just end by saying that soil fertility there's a scientific component without a doubt but there's also a bit of a, a, an art form or um, and that stems that artwork in some way, some ways stems from a large amount of uncertainty when we're thinking about soil the complexity of soil um, and how many factors are going into predicting this seemingly simple thing was just as like how much nitrogen might be available to a crop right well turns out that that's a really tricky question to answer and we'll talk about all those reasons right we'll talk about that we'll get into that as the semester evolves and so uh, with that I'll end and um, and just say that uh, you know it's important to kind of frame what we're talking about uh, as the semester um, you know to kind of start the semester and that's really hopefully provide you some context here so you've got a little bit better sense